Uh, so welcome to the BFNT Regional Environment Network Sessions online from the 14th to the 21st of September. My name is Jane Stevenson and I'm the Bay of Plenty Regional Coordinator for New Zealand Land Care Trust. This event is an annual collaboration between New Zealand Land Care Trust and EnviroHub to support environmental groups across the Bay of Plenty. This year, after two in-person event cancellations due to COVID-19, we are taking the Ren Hui online for a week of lunchtime inspirational kōrero. We hope you have a delicious kai and a cup of tea with you today and have registered for our other fantastic REN sessions coming up over this week, so tomorrow and Monday. These sessions will be recorded and the links will be available for viewing on the EnviroHub and New Zealand Land Care Trust websites, uh, so you can share them from there. We'll also email them to you. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could keep your mics off during the presentation. Um, but uh, if you and if you have any questions, just uh, type them into the chat function, um, and Grant will have a look at those um, and answer those at the end of his presentation. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of hearing from Grant Ryan. Uh, Grant describes himself as a hopelessly addicted inventor. He has founded a number of companies and is now having fun trying to help make New Zealand predator free with the Cacophony project. He has also served on the board of the Foundation for Research, Science and Technology, the New Zealand Government's Venture Investment Fund and Canterbury Development Corporation. Grant has a degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in ecological economics from the University of Canterbury. Today, Grant will give us an introduction to the Cacophony Project and how they are developing open source technology for bird and predator monitoring and control. Um, uh, Grant, I just want to let you know we've got a couple from a um, couple of people from Predator Free Bay of Plenty and Predator Free groups in the Bay of Plenty. Um, so, Kira Grant, thank you for being with us today, and uh, you're welcome to take over. Uh, kia ora everyone, thanks for your interest in our, our little project. Uh, I normally prefer to be interrupted with questions, but um, I find on Zoom I can't really multitask and read very well, so I'll try and whiz through it reasonably quickly and then get to your questions then. I will just share the screen. Let's see if that works. It's going to go. Um, so we called our project the Cacophony Project because it's not really about, well, we are getting rid of uh, predators. It's about bringing the cacophony of birdsong back. And we're approaching it slightly differently than some of the other people that are out there. Um, I got into this fairly um, accidentally because I happened to have to move to Akaroa after the Christchurch earthquakes. And like thousands of other Kiwis, I had to do a bit of trapping because we were infested. And then I started to use the current tools and the engineer in me just thought, man, there's got to be a better way of doing that. And I come from a geeky IT background. So the, the way we're kind of approaching this is we're trying to make use the best use of IT. So if you're using IT, things can get twice as good or half the price. So some of the stuff I'll talk about, you'll go, whoa, that's way too expensive. It'll never work. But that stuff is just getting cheaper and better. Um, and then it's all open source, so I don't own any of it. So anyone can take any of what we use and they can do whatever they like with it. And it's a really great collective way for people to solve big, hard problems. It works really well. And we're, we're not interested in scientific discovery. We're interested in engineering solutions. We're, we're not anti-science, we love science, but science creates science papers and discoveries. We're about making products that work, that make your, your job useful. That's why there's a different department in the university that does that. And um, and so we've got a whole list of things that we're working through from bird monitors to predator monitors, um, how we think about different models for uh, trapping. And then we're actually starting to get into the trapping side of it, which is some brand new stuff I'll show you at the end. It's pretty exciting. So the first part we, I wanted to know is someone who's doing um, involved in this is if we're getting rid of the predators, are we actually getting the bird song back? So we just have a little device that you can leave out in the field forever, pretty much, and it can be solar powered and it takes little samples of, of sound, uploads them to the cloud, and we have this thing called a cacophony index. So it can kind of tell you uh, the number of birds going up or down. There's lots of products that are more detailed that you go out and you can do get more detail, but this is really for designing for long term to know in one spot are you, are you getting more or less birds. And eventually, you'll be able to get down to the level of 
understanding individual birds. So we had the Wellington Predator Free Project ask if they had more pork there and we were able to use AI to find little bits of more pork there. So that stuff's just getting better and better. The one thing that we uh, had to try and work out was, you know, exactly what's going on out there. So I spent uh, probably the first year and a half mucking around with this, thinking I was the worst trapper in New Zealand. Um, because well, we weren't having much luck with our traps, uh, but we suspected there was a lot more going on than we thought. And I don't like reinventing things. So we, we're using trail cameras, but they're designed for pigs and deer and they don't pick up things. So we've designed this thermal camera that not only can you see a lot more that you never see on a trail camera, you never see on a chew card, but I don't, we don't want to sit and go through a whole lot of videos. So we designed it so that you can actually use artificial intelligence which is really just a fancy word for pattern recognition so that you can um, see exactly what's out there and count it. So if you like um, counting predators with chew cards or tracking tunnels or going through videos, you can do that. But we have a tool where you can go and put a, a camera out in the bush and basically at the end of the week, it'll give you a, a table and it'll tell you what's out there. And then you can do your treatment and you can go back and it'll tell you how it's changed. And while it's not perfect, it is vastly faster and easier. And we're just looking at really showing how we can do that with the Banks Peninsula project so that we can um, roll it out around more people. Um, so the, the next thing that um, we were really fascinated with, what's happened to my screen? It's gone, hello. Um, Hopefully you can see, well, oh, sorry, what, what we're doing here is we're trying to test our camera. This is our camera in the foreground with a, the beige box and some trail cameras just to show how much better it is than a, a normal um, trail camera for, for, for looking at rats. So I'm not sure what's happening at your end. Um, it's, taking, it's freezing a little bit at my end, but hopefully a, a video is going to start playing. It's not playing yet, but hopefully it comes through in a minute. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Yes. Here we go. Okay, so uh, actually I'll, I'll flick through. It actually doesn't matter too much. Um, I flicked through one, but basically it showed the previous. This is showing a test of automated possum traps. So there's two possum traps there, a, a good nature and an NZ auto trap. And this is the typical sort of... Um, behavior we see when we when, when we have our camera out there. Um, most predators just are on their way somewhere and they don't interact with traps. If you've got an area that's never been trapped, you'll trap heaps with almost anything. But if you've had traps for any length of time, the vast majority of times I'll just walk past them. And the gut reaction when you first see this is we must have the wrong bait, we must have the wrong traps, but we've done this over and over again and, and we it, it, it's a very common behavior um, and it kind of gets to the crux of well you can potentially get some suppression with some of these tools you'll never get to zero with a tool as ineffective as, as these tools um, and and I I say that very reluctantly because I take my hat off to anyone doing anything innovative but we're interested in how can you get rid of all of them and we just don't think you can do it with something that they mostly walk past um, the previous video that I was past actually showed um, a zero rat interaction where no rats went in a tracking tunnel and they um, basically were running all over the place. Um, most tools just don't see what's there. I'm not sure if that slide is playing. Oh, here we go. So this is a, another interesting thing that um, you can see with our camera. So what we're trying to do with this camera again is try and work out exactly what are these predators doing. So this we had two cameras pointing at a tree with a chew card. So the first kind of 20 or so animals just go straight past the chew card and ignore it. Then what's inter interesting is you'll have one animal will come up and hit the chew card and you can see that that's the rat finding the chew card. And then the thing that's really fascinating next is the possum still walks past. But as you see the next set of rats, they all just immediately follow the scent trail straight to the chew card. And then what happens is you can see this possum that would normally walk past, he's going, you can see him following that central and he's 
now he's found the tube card. So why that's interesting is that at the end of a week, with normal detection, you'd see a chew card with a bunch of chew marks, or you'd see a camera, and it'll just show the ones where they hit the actual card, but you wouldn't see all the first, a lot of the first ones wandering past. It also gives you insights on how you might uh, eradicate things like possums by feeding rats to create a scent trail to get them to come into a trap to interact. So it's actually, it's like having a better telescope. You can see what's kind of going on. And then the, uh, there's some really interesting stuff we've done around, um, Digital digital lures to see if we can get more um, get them coming in from a larger area, and because when you've got a whole lot of predators, there's food competition, and so food can work quite well. But when you've got a very low density or the last number, there's lots of other food around, and so if they've got a full belly, food lures don't work that well. So what's next on the list? A little bit of uh, social interaction, and so it looks like mimicking social sounds is actually a really good way of um, uh, getting possums in. And um, I mean, one of the reasons I quite like this project is people go, oh Grant, what are you, what are you working on? And I can say, oh, I'm thinking quite a lot about possum erotica actually. And uh, it can certainly uh, stop a conversation, that's for sure. Um, but I won't talk too much about that. I'm gonna whiz through a couple of these things because let's just see. Um, so th this is um, another video that this is a group in Auckland um, where they had six different traps, six different freshly baited lures, and they were pretty sure they had some predators there, but they weren't, just weren't catching anything. And this is a typical, when we show people this for the first time on their traps, they're quite horrified because they just don't have a tool to see what's happening. <laughs> and your first thought is, that can't be right, it must be better than that. But um, this is very normal. And uh, I look at that as an, op as an engineer and go, well, there's such an opportunity to improve it, um, the industry, because what a lot of people are trying to do is automate these things that people are walking past, uh, other predators walking past, and I don't see any way that that can actually make much of a difference. <clears throat> All of this activity is just over four nights. Um, I'll, I won't carry on, you get the idea. I'm not trying to depress you either, I'm just trying to um, say this is what's actually happening. <laughs> um, now because we got get so much disbelief at this, what we what we wanted to do was say, well can we get some other data that might tell us if we just happen to wherever we put a camera have really hard to get predators. So what we did is we took the 60 best monitored projects from Trap NZ and we looked at their trap density and how often they were catching things and then tried to work out well how often are they interacting with traps given the catch rates. And the only way you could get the catch rates to match the other data is that they have a very very low interaction rate. So um, you know, less than half a percent of the time. They must be living around these traps, not getting caught. It's kind of the only way to make the, the data match up. So when you acknowledge that, then the, um, this was the data from Trap NZ that showed the average catch per trap per year, which in case you're wondering is only about 1.8. Um, so most traps are sitting out there not doing much most of the time. So the, the reason we uh, emphasize this so much is that there are a whole lot of projects where they've noticed that if a trap triggers, it doesn't kill 100% of the animals. And they're spending a lot of money trying to get that from you know, 80% up to 100%. You go, well, that's got to make a big difference. But actually, if most of them just walk past, it doesn't make that much difference at all. And similarly, if you've got an auto resetting device, if most animals walk past it, then, I mean, it definitely saves you labor. There's no doubt about that. And if you're just interested in suppression, that's fine. But we're interested in total elimination. So doesn't make much difference. The same with auto lures or long life lures. If they walk past fresh lures, then um, again, it doesn't make any near as much different as you, difference as you might intuitively think. And I'm just whizzing past that. But the biggest thing that makes a difference is can you get a high interaction rate? And that's what we're really focused on. So you can try and get more encounters. If you think about the, this area, you've got a you can try and get more into the trap area or once they're in the area you can get them to trigger the trap or when they trigger the trap you can get a higher kill rate and there's a whole list of things that we've got here and i'm not going to whiz through them all 
but basically a lot of the things we think are, are really worth doing uh, most people are not really working on and we're desperately trying to say we're not the cleverest ones who've got all the answers but we're really keen to get more people working on things that are likely to make a big difference um, and this is our kind of new fresh off the um, our latest go at a, a, a much higher catch rate trap this is if you've got uh, feral soft toys around it works for those um, this is just some early prototypes that kind of show the idea what we wanted to have was something that from a predator's point of view looks very open like a looks like a um a very low barrier to entry so it looks like they can walk right through it so just the last couple of weeks we've had one robust enough and the blinds obviously won't hold a, a wild cat or a ferret or a possum but what happens is the blinds fly up and they they put it into the back of a um a, a normal live capture trap and this is kind of hard to see what's going on but we on all of these um all of these traps we've also had a uh, trail camera so those first two ones of the bird and the hedgehog were the only ones the trail camera actually got it going off because they they're just not designed for triggering for our predators so you just don't see what's going on but what we're showing here is that um, a whole range of animals are happy to wander into this device um, for some reason cats and hedgehogs and rats seem very happy to go into it um, but they all seem quite happy to go into it so the three things we're trying to test with this trap is a can you get a much higher interaction rate and then is the trap fast enough to does it go off fast enough to actually catch them and that was a very large rat by the way it's kind of hard to get a feel for it from the size of that but man it was a big thing but so it's a super fast trap and it looks like we've got a kind of a very high rate at which they're happy to wander in we've got a very high rate at which they can um, go off and the last part that we're trying to test is if it goes off do they try and get out through the blinds or do they go into the trap so this next I, I just put the hedgehog glass in case you thought it was a super fast hedgehog but no it's pretty good for hedgehogs too um, and then this little video um, it kind of shows the top left hand side that's where the, the live capture trap is so the that's a that's a big rat that's gone into that one and it works just as well for the possum possum goes in there and um, this next video kind of shows it a, a little better because it shows that the cat going in and then it shows the blinds going off it runs around a little bit and then it goes straight out the back and is caught in a robust cage so so that's it, and it's easy to look at this and go wow that's too big and expensive and not very practical but this is designed for those hard to get predators the last hard to get ones you know they spend hundreds of thousands on motatapu trying to get the last uh stoat or you've got really high highly valued um you know bird nesting with lots of traps around it that aren't catching the devices um but we think even for predator suppression instead of having 300 ineffective traps you may only have five more effective traps and instead of checking a whole lot of traps with nothing in it you may move them around because if you have a device that can identify lure and kill everything in an area there's no point leaving it there forever um, and that's a big change in mindset and that you can take an effective device and move it around and catch a whole lot more than leaving ineffective devices there forever part of the 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 big pushback we get is around well it's too expensive but the inherent assumption in a cheap ineffective uh, cheap device that you don't have to has low maintenance is that it has to stay there forever because it's never going to get everything so um it kind of there's an acknowledgement that it'll, you have to leave it there forever whereas it's a kind of a, a different approach that we're having a crack at um and then this is a very crude photo of what we're doing where we had an automatic kill mechanism in it so basically we have the animals go in there they crawl up they go in a, it's basically an it's an nz auto trap um, and then they roll down and die and so you can have piles of dead bodies in there so it can have multiple catches of multiple types of predators um, we think a much more practical way of doing that for um, professionally trapped projects is to have um you know so, as cyanide or some sort of poison or it can go into a it can basically plug into any other sort of killing device like a spitfire as well um 
and then we think the the ultimate device will actually be something where we can actually track it um, and then fire it with a paintball of poison but that's a bit too outside of what um, people are comfortable with at the moment there's lots of reasons why we think that could be the ultimate effective thing where you have um, swarms of these things that can move through an area um because they're much smaller and lighter this is a, a feral radio controlled car we found um but you can show that it it can kind of track it we hadn't trained it on what a so i got a bit confused about what that was but um you can see that you know ultimately um there's a whole lot of ways that we can apply much more clever technology than what we're doing but it's all about trying to get a higher interaction rate if you want to get it down to zero um, and one of the cool things I'll show you here, this is my favorite video out of the whole lot, and there's not a predator in sight, but this is a visual image of the software that is being developed to make all of this work together. So what happens with software is you upload it to a, a, a database called GitHub where all the software is, and what you can do is you can see who's working on which bits of software and how they all link together. And so this is basically the value of open source where if it's all open source then people can come in and they can do different bits and your collective it's kind of like your collective wisdom of all these people working together to try and take on the rats stoats and possums and so as it builds momentum you can see that the system of um, software can learn and affect and grow and it's kind of like this new organism is of collective wisdom of folk around new zealand and around the world that are chipping in to try and take on this really hard problem and um and then we've got a whole lot of great supporters there um that i'll just mention there uh great um just one thing about when you're dealing with exponential technology is um sometimes on these forms we fill out they say well how many predators have you caught in the last year and how many are you going to catch next year and most of those answers are pretty much zero or so close to that it doesn't matter but we're trying to make it so that you can do it at scale so quite often this high-tech stuff looks disappointing to start off with and then it becomes amazing like our thermal camera i think is already at the amazement area because if, unless for some reason you like counting footprints and chew cards that or tracking tunnels that most animals walk past um most people who have seen what that does they go wow that's we don't really want to do that again <laughs> that seems fairly primitive um and i think again once we get our traps going that will um, help that as well um, so we can kind of see this this idea where you can have a line of these devices where you're listening for what's going on adapting your lures luring them in identifying them eliminating them and having an area sweep through and be able to protect the whole thing so the whole value of getting to zero is you don't have to keep doing it and then you get the real biodiversity um, impacts coming back we know that that's what happens on islands and we're really trying to work out the tools so that you can do it at scale economically on the mainland and that is our a quick whiz through our our little project so um there you go i'll try and see if i can work out how to find these questions and see if there are any questions that i have yeah there are a few questions in the chat um room there Good. Uh, see how we're going here um what have we got i wonder dean if you want to unmute yourself and ask that question directly oh hi can you hear me yes i can oh, oh hi uh dean flavel here hey um firstly thank you fantastic ideas um around that um I'm, I'm ringing with my hat as the chairperson for Mowal. I'm not quite sure where you're situated, but um, Mount, Mount Monganui in, in, in Tauranga. Sure. Uh, I'm yeah. down in Akaroa. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so um, what, one of the areas that we're looking at, uh, because um, uh, is, is, I suppose, um, pest control, there was a proposal at one point to have a kind of a pest um, management fence put around uh, the monga itself uh, to make it a pest-free environment um, and that was maybe about five years ago but um, there was opposition to that so I mean in the end we've gone away with that but we have upped the uh, 
the there's a lot of rabbits on there and so we're dealing with them by shooting at night time uh, but um, I don't think we have uh, a true idea of what sort of other pests apart from knowing from the kills um, and the traps there are traps there but like you have mentioned um, not all of them actually catch uh, so um, it'd be interesting I think for us to know what, what type of pests are there uh, and um, I suppose how many uh, and, and we also have a whole lot of humans that walk around the mount as well so um, in a year there can be up to a million humans kind of walking up and around the mountain and so it's the bush areas that we concentrate on we have a population of small blue penguins yep. uh, we have uh, uh, seals uh, that, that uh, uh, come in the, the beach areas of the mount uh, but at the moment we've been getting a lot of um, cats and um, unlike feral cats uh, where you can kind of coach them out with a bit of food uh, we think these may be more domestic because they kind of hunt bigger and they kind of don't always return uh, so yes yeah, so I suppose my question is uh, the technology uh, can it work in, in, in an urban type environment uh, considering uh, there are a lot of people who also um, visit and and with people there, there's a lot of opinion around how trapping should be done and uh, I suppose it's how do you socialize uh, the idea yeah good good question and I can kind of see from a bunch of the other questions that I've, I've worked out how to get to now which is good um, so one of the um, you know cat, cats are are an interesting one um they obviously you know the feral cats are much easier when you're out in the bush but one of the advantages of uh, i guess cleverer technology for example when a cat goes into a cage like this we can have an rf tag reader for example where in wellington you know the cats are, are tagged and i suspect like dogs they'll be tagged everywhere eventually and then you'll be able to either send someone a fine for having them in an area where it is, it's important, or you'll be able to um, show them a, a videos of them you know, doing what they don't want to do. But we take the view that we've got no right to tell anyone what should and shouldn't be there. We're providing tools and you, so you've got more options that you're then able to socialize within whatever community you've got. Um, but we, we're pretty sure that you won't be able to do it with, um, tools that can't tell the different differentiate between them so there's a couple of questions there about how do you deal with bycatch and how do you deal with um where you've got nocturnal birds so the first part is that thermal camera that we've got we can point it at the trap and we can have it so that it just doesn't go off for birds it only goes off for your target species and you can get that as clever as you want and you can potentially have it so that it can have adaptive lures so it sees something wandering by and it tries a different sound lure or a smell or a, a food and then if that doesn't work maybe it's a female so you can get adaptive like that the lower cost version that we've got for areas down here where we don't have nocturnal birds is we just have it so that it only goes on an hour after dusk and it turns off an hour before dawn so that basically anything that's moving around at night down here is a predator and it catches it um, and we suspect that you'll be able to pretty much create a whole lot of different custom versions of this trap depending on what you're trying to trap and and, and what are the important things for you so i'm just trying to read some other questions while right. i'm talking as well so ben's given a thumbs up i think you've almost answered um Nardines, um, so there's bite, yeah. How do the live capture traps deal with bycatch? Yep, so humans, yeah, and humans, I mean, humans are interesting things, <laughs> um. We're, we're quite lucky in New Zealand we don't actually realize it like in, in places like the UK they have to control 
Canadian squirrels to protect, uh, you know, their endemic squirrel, whereas we're kind of like um, birds, rats, and you know, most people are are pretty um, keen to get rid of the predators. I, I think it's been quite a dramatic change since I've been involved in the social understanding of the damage they're doing, and I think if people really understood how bad it is in New Zealand compared to the rest of the world, where we have a higher proportion of our species in trouble than places like Africa that are, you know, hunting things. Um, you know, we, we're not doing that. We're not chopping down endemic, you know, forests and things anymore. But these, you know, they're just getting eaten. They weren't designed to coexist. And, um, you know, so there's a much better understanding of that. And the whole point of what we're trying to do is I'm deeply uncomfortable with the idea that we just continually kill. And the advantage of doing it so that you get it to zero is you don't have to do it anymore. And so I see this project of trying to eliminate lots of innocent animals as more humane than what our current alternative is. Uh, there's a question there um, around how, um, whether you have a prototype that groups can use right. at the moment and how robust are the systems? So are they good, good for, um, for environmental key groups to be using? Yeah, so our cameras have been out for, um, you know, quite a long time now and we've had them down in the Auckland Islands and all sorts of things. So the cameras are pretty, we're pretty comfortable with the robustness of that. The traps are fresh off the uh, development line. So they're only three in existence and we're busy testing those at the moment and including building a, um, a way that we can repeat, set them off. So they won't be available for purchase um, until early next year, probably. Um, but we're working as hard as we can to try and you know, make sure they're robust. The group that I work with, we all have a background in product design and engineering. And there's just a whole system of processes you go through to try and make it robust and improve it. And, but we're, um, we've got a, a funder who's particularly keen to to buy some uh, traps and then get them out to trapping groups that may not have budgets necessarily for them to try and get as many people using them as possible. So if you're interested in that, let us know um, sooner rather than later and we can put you on a list and see if we can, um, because, it, because when you've got a new tool and you've got all these people with deep on the ground experience, um, we know we don't have all the answers on the best way to set them up in different environments and the best lures and things. So we're just keen to get them out and with people who have some of that on the ground knowledge in their area, and then they can adapt and use them in the way they see, see fit. I can see Nadine's already put her hand up <laughs> uh, for the Waikato, and I can see Fiona's got a big smile on her face, so I think she'd probably like to be on that list too, along with Anna and Glenn, I imagine. <laughs> get them out to the groups here in the Bay of Plenty. So yeah, we're super keen, Grant. Yep, and I'll just, I'll, I'll answer that fertility one, because yes, fertility is, is an option, um, but I suspect, well, it's actually, it's a complicated question. I, I mean, I was quite optimistic about gene editing there for a while, but there's a whole lot of issues with that. Um, but yes, because we're open source, we try to have as wide a list of possible so, uh, ideas. So think of this as a whole set of building blocks that you can build together. So you, you could, if you had a way that you could um, make animals infertile by going through the traps, then you could add that to it. Because we throw out as many crazy ideas as possible, one of the ones that someone put on there was um, when they go in the trap, you could microwave their uh, nether regions to do that. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I don't know that that would work, but um, you know, if you come up with any ideas, then you can kind of see how it can fit into that suite of uh, suite of things. That's great, Grant. Um, I feel like you may have answered all the questions. There was just one around thermal um, trail cameras be used to monitor birds. So you oh, talked yes, about yes. that at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, they can and they do. So we, um, you know, the most important AI part of that we have is to tell the difference between birds and predators. So we it basically acts as a bird counter as well. And long term, we should be able to tell the difference between different types of birds. Um, so yeah, you kind of get a a bird count as part of the part of the um, predator counting as well.
great technology. All right, well, I think if we haven't got any, um, oh yes, and Ange just picked up that it would be great to be using this perhaps in the big big scale in uh, the Kaimamamaku ranges. So um, I'll definitely share this uh, this video with uh, with Wendy. Right. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Grant. I think we'll um, finish up there, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, Grant was actually it was actually your brother that was going to come up for our um, in person event that was supposed to be held a few um, weeks back. Uh, so it was lovely to get you here to, uh, today, Grant. Thank you very much, um, and we really appreciate you all coming along um, to this REM session, and. Um, uh, be sure to register for tomorrow's reading session, which will be on um, by Joe Allen from the Venture Centre uh, on the business of doing good, how to work together as an ecosystem. So that's bound to be enlightening. Uh, and also on Monday, we've got Professor Carolyn King talking about um, all the different rats. So a good opportunity to get to know your rats. Uh, so those are both at 12 o'clock and you can register on the EnviroHub website. Um, thank you once again, Grant, and have a great day, everybody. Um, kia ora.